Okay, so now that we understand what gauge theory is, I want to discuss some classical aspects of Abelian gauge theory. In particular, I'm going to focus on only the first part of the, um, the action given above, just the part involving the A field alone. So this turns out to describe just abelian, normal, ordinary, four-dimensional Maxwell electrodynamics. Okay. So the theory described by this action is just Maxwell E and M, which you know and love. Okay. So, uh, so first, let's figure out the classical equations of motion. If you vary this with respect to A, then you find that the equations of motion are just d mu f mu nu equals to zero. And um, everyone should verify this, so check that you can derive this. Uh, this is a, a good check of your uh, action varying abilities. And um, these equations of motion are, are really sort of very nice and very simple. Um, uh, this contains the full content of the, the regular Maxwell's equations. If you also include the, the constraints coming from the fact that f is the anti-symmetric derivative of a. In particular, if you write down to, to make these look more familiar, what you should do is uh, write, so first pick a time direction, call that direction zero, and then call f zero i the electric field and call the magnetic field half times epsilon i j k f j k. And then if you work out what these equations are in components, these become the familiar ugly form of the Maxwell's equations, curl of E is blah, 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 and so on. Okay. So this is just the Lagrangian describing what we call free electrodynamics, so free E and M with no matter. Okay. So now I want to point out an interesting fact. Let's compare these equations of motion to the Klein-Gordon equation for a massless scalar field. So let's convert the equation of motion for a massless scalar phi. And the equation of motion is just d square phi equals to zero. So this defines what is called a well-defined Cauchy problem, which is a fancy way to say the following thing. Let's imagine that you pick some time t equals to zero. Okay, so I'm going to draw a picture here. Here's time, and so and these directions are space, and so here's t equals to zero. Now, if you um, tell me what the field is doing at that time, and furthermore, what the first time derivative of the first time derivative, excuse me, of the field is at that time, then the fact that this is a well-defined Cauchy problem means that you can solve the equations of motion uniquely and figure out what phi is doing for all later times. Okay, for all time greater than zero. In other words, you can solve the equations of motion to figure out what phi is doing. This theory has predictive power. If you know what's happening at initial times, you can figure out uniquely everything that is happening at later times. This is what we want physics to do. Okay, this is nice. Okay, this niceness is not shared for the Maxwell equation. Okay, so in particular, let me explain why. The fundamental degree of freedom in the Maxwell equation is this gauge field A mu of x. So the analog of this problem would be if we knew what a mu was at some early time, if we could figure out by solving the Maxwell equations what a mu is doing at all later times. And uh, this is not true for the Maxwell equation. Okay. And um, so let me just write, say that in, in words. So the Maxwell equation does not have the same nice property. And uh, you can figure that out by staring at the components of the equation, but there's kind of a simple way to understand why this is true. So again, let me draw another picture. 
So, um, so suppose again here I have uh, time t equals zero. Now notice that if a mu of x is a solution to the equations of motion, then so is a mu of x minus uh, one over e d mu lambda of x, right? This is by gauge invariance, right? Because this, this gauge transformation of A does not affect F, and the equation of motion cares only about F, okay? So given a solution A, I can generate a new solution, A mu of x minus D mu lambda of x, where this lambda of x is arbitrary. It can depend on space and time, okay? So now, for example, if I pick lambda to be something to be uh, so that lambda t equals to zero x is zero, but lambda for t greater than zero and spatial x is not zero, then here's one solution to the equations of motion. Let me call this a mu of x. And if I now consider this to be a mu prime of x, a mu prime is going to agree with a mu at early times because lambda there is zero, but it's going to disagree at late times, okay? Yet, by gauge invariance, it will still be a solution to the equations of motion. Okay, so what this means is the Maxwell equations do not uniquely fix the time evolution of A mu, okay? And that's just a fact. Okay, so what do we do with this? It looks like our theory, which we like so much, doesn't have predictive power in that knowing what happens at t equals zero does not fix what happens at later times. So the way to save our classical theory is to make the following assumption. So I make the following assertion. So we save the theory by saying the following thing. We say things that are not gauge invariant like A, for example, are not physical. Okay. So by declaring this, you see, we're making it okay that we can't understand what A does at later times because A, is not, a is, um, isn't gauge invariant, it transforms under a gauge transformation, and so it's not physical. In a sense, it's not real. That's what I'm saying here. Things that are not gauge invariant aren't physical. They don't define well-defined observables. Okay. So, um, so what is gauge invariant? Well, the gauge invariant data is f mu nu, and uh, you can check, which you know already from your, your courses on ENM uh, earlier, that f mu nu is physical, and this satisfies a perfectly nice Cauchy problem. This satisfies a nice Cauchy problem, and you can uniquely specify its evolution later in time. And uh, you know this already from your ENM course. In your ENM course, you did exactly this. You figured out what the field strength did at later times from the field strength at early times. Okay. There's no issue solving first time evolution. So let me be a little bit more explicit about this. Let me write that f mu nu as d mu a nu minus uh, d nu a nu, this definition. Then the equation of motion, the Maxwell equation, is just d mu d mu a nu minus d mu a nu equals to zero. And uh, as I said earlier, this is not a well-defined equation for the time evolution of a. To make it one, what we need to do is we need to do what's called fixing a gauge. So fixing a gauge is imposing an extra constraint on A to remove this ambiguity that we had to shift it by lambda. Okay. So one choice is Lorenz gauge. Okay. So Lorenz gauge is the following constraint on A. D mu A mu equals to zero. Lorenz gauge happens to be Lorentz invariant, those are two different people, okay? Lorenz does not have a T in here, uh, which is a, a poor fact, these are often confused. And um, Lorenz gauge is d mu a mu equals to zero. If you impose this constraint on A, then the Maxwell equation just becomes d mu d mu a nu equals to zero. 
which is a, a perfectly good wave equation for all of the components of A. Okay? And uh, this propagates all the components of A in time, and you can solve this. Now, um, in particular, if you go to Fourier space, what you find is, so go to Fourier, then this equation just becomes omega square minus q square a mu equals to zero, where this is the frequency and q is the spatial momentum. And uh, notice that this is the this is um, uh, telling you that the on shell energy of a single quanta of this omega sub q equals to q, the magnitude of q. And uh, what this means is the photon is massless. There's no mass term in this dispersion relation. And that you knew that because it satisfies a massless wave equation. And of course, you know from earlier on in your life that the photon is massless. This is how to see that the photon is massless. So by the way, it's still not true that all the components of A nu, all four components of it are physical, because it turns out we have not completely fixed the gauge symmetry yet. There is still a residual gauge invariance Uh, that which is a further gauge transformation which preserves the condition that d mu a mu equals to zero. So uh, I'm not going to review here how this works. You can look in the notes if you're interested. But you might recall that for element from elementary ENM in basic ENM, if you have an electromagnetic wave, it's only the transverse components of A, in other words, the components of A that are perpendicular to the momentum. are physical. And um, if you go through this residual gauge invariance more carefully, you can check that after imposing it, there are indeed only two such components, if we're in four dimensions. Okay. And um, yeah, so one way to check that is to see that only these two contribute to f mu nu. A more formal way to do it is to check how the residual gauge invariance interplays with the Lorentz gauge. And um, I won't go through in this any more detail, but one can go through it carefully to check. Okay, so this more or less um, concludes our discussion of the classical uh, Maxwell theory. And uh, next we're gonna to turn to the quantum version of the Maxwell theory where all these subtleties play a really important role.